These are women who want the three P's. They want partnership, pregnancy, and parenthood. Yeah. That's what they But they lack the three E's. Men who are eligible, educated, and equal. Um, and we might say eager. <laughs> My friend said eager, you need to that's have a good one. Men who are eager to partner and have children. We are joined again by Marsha Inhorn, the author of Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze Their Eggs. Thank you, Marsha, for joining us again for part two of our conversation. If you didn't see part one, go back and check it out. We talked about her study, the demographic, the emotions that go into the egg freezing journey. And this episode, we are talking about what Marsha found in her research is that women are freezing because of what she calls the mating gap, that women cannot find partners. So Marsha, welcome back. Thank you again for being with us. And I want to dive right into what you found in your research and your study. Oh, thank you, Beth. I'm so glad to be with you. Yeah, let me first say that there has been a lot of attention to egg freezing as a career planning strategy, <laughs> that somehow women would, are using egg freezing or turning to egg freezing because of their professional ambition of education and cl climbing the corporate ladder. And that has been an assumption from the very beginning of this technology mm. and a lot of just about it, a lot of critique of it. So I honestly went into my study, you know, and again, this is a, a large NSF study, National Science Foundation study, thinking that was my main hypothesis, that women were maybe doing this because they wanted to get ahead in their professions. Um, and so I started interviewing women one by one. And within about the first 10 interviews, I thought, oh my goodness, that wow. is not hypothesis here. This really has nothing to do with that. And in fact, out of the, there were 114 women that I interviewed who were doing egg freezing for non-medical reasons. These are healthy women who had done it, you know, electively. But um, of those, it, it was only 2% of women had explicitly undertaken egg freezing because they really were planning to do something career-wise in the next 10 years that they felt they couldn't have children during that period. And the rest of it, for the most part, was about partnership problems. Mm. You know, women, I mean, many women were just, as I said, single, single, single. That's why I'm talking to you. I'm single. You know, I don't know why I'm single. It was never what I expected to be at age 36, but I'm single. I don't have a partner. And that's why I'm doing this. Um, so 82% of the women in the study froze their eggs because they were single and many of these were women who simply didn't have a partner. They didn't have one now. They didn't see one in the future. Mm. Um, and there was a, also a significant um, percentage of women who had been in a relationship. Some had been married or in an engagement or in a long-term relationship, and the relationship had broken. There, It was what I called real relationship trauma. Oh, yeah. You know, leaving women often in their late 30s or early 40s, you know, with no children, something that they had desired but hadn't happened in the relationship. So these were single women and, you know, that they talked about this, that it was really, you know, I don't know what happened. I'm mystified. I think I'm a dateable person. I am mystified, but yeah. I'm, I'm in this situation where I don't have a partner and I really want to be a mom. So in a way, I, I said, these are women who want the three Ps. They want partnership, pregnancy, and parenthood. Yeah. That's what they But they lack the three Es, men who are eligible, educated, and equal. Um, and we might say eager. <laughs> My friends said eager. Eager, that's a good one. Men who are eager to partner and have children. But anyway, you know, and so these are just, they were having trouble finding partners in, in sense, you know, in the sense that these were women educated, you know, post second wave feminism, their moms were sometimes kind of feminists telling them, be what you're going to be, yeah. you can have everything, a good home life, a good work life, and you want somebody who's going to support you and be equal to you. So women were saying, you know, I believe in gender equality at work and at home, I want somebody who makes me feel supported and loved. And they were having trouble finding that equality, right? Um, and didn't want to settle. That was the term most mm -hmm, often used. Mm -hmm. For somebody who didn't feel like they were the right person, you know, that they weren't giving them the kinds of feelings of love and soulmate 
soulmateishness that they were hoping for. And so they didn't want to go into what they call desperation marriages just oh, to have children. Yeah. You know, and saying, look, I've seen a lot of bad marriages and I don't, you know, that's not what I want. I don't want to do this just because I feel the need to have children. But what am I going to do? And so then there's now a technology. Well, I guess what I can do right now, my technological sort of stopgap measure, my Band-Aid measure here, I'm going to freeze my eggs and keep looking for that for that unicorn. The that unicorn, man, yes. <laughs> the magical man out there who, you know, I'm looking for. And so it was such a recurring theme, you know, and I really heard a lot of women's gender laments. I mean, we can talk about what women thought was going on, you know, about women's own maybe higher expectations these days for relationships. And they believe that men have lower commitments to these kind of traditional heterosexual relationships. So they were talking a lot about what they thought was going on. And I, you know, they have real concerns. I mean, I, I can tell you that women believe that, you know, they have been socialized in this era to want something, to want to be with men, and that men are not socialized in the same way. So the gender socialization is, is something has gone awry here. And so that, you know, women want this equal partner, but maybe men don't. And so, honestly, in anthropology, we have these two great terms. We have the term hypergamy, which is marrying up, Mm -hmm. and hypogamy, which is marrying down. Traditionally, and I'm going to say this is in the United States and probably most other societies around the world, women have told to partner hypergamously, to find a man slightly older, better education, better income, and men have been socialized to engage in hypogamy. Somebody maybe younger and very fertile, somebody who's maybe not as educated, maybe doesn't want to work, they can support them, right? Men, the breadwinner. So you've got these traditional gender norms, and now you've got women who I mean, talk about hypergamy, they really don't have any place to go up, you know, and it's not that they want to go up, they just want to find somebody who feels equal to them. Whereas men, you know, there was a lot of discussion about men not wanting to be with a very educated, strong, professional woman. Women really talked about, they called it the I word, intimidation, that they have so, so many experiences of trying to be with men and, you know, as soon as they told them where they worked or what their educational background was, you know, men would make these really remarks like, oh, you're kidding. That means you're smarter than I am. Or are you kidding? We can't go out. You know, there's no way, uh, you know, and or women would like invite a man over. He'd see her condo, her car. And it was that would be the last day. You know, men, women Ugh. felt that a lot of men were intimidated by them because they just weren't, you know, couldn't live up to what this woman already was. So there was that going on. And then women also really uh, talked about this unreadiness about among men, the yes. unready man, <laughs> yes. the man, and you might get into a relationship with that man and he will drag you along. Well, that, that, yeah, I, that was my, that's my story. You know, I met and, you know, I did the dating thing. I was found myself single at 34 and, you know, I met Rob, an, an amazing partner, a uh, great connection, really saw him as my person, my future. And then, you know, as I'm getting older, my anxiety around my bi- biological clock starts ticking and, and we, our timelines did not align. And I would definitely categorize, categorize him as an unready man. I mean, we eventually got there. We have our son now, but he certainly was one of those, like, great in every way. The relationship was great, but just, you know not ready, misaligned. And I love what you say too, is like, uh, and I think you said this on the other podcast, um, girls got to eat is that someone needs to be talking to men. And so we are dying to get some men on this podcast to understand the other side of it. Like what makes you afraid? What makes you unready? Why are you really intimidated and why? And I found that I'm, I'm glad you brought up the intimidation because I found that piece so frustrating. I find it to be so true. But you would think that the very things that women should be desired for, you know, their their intelligence, their ambition, um, their badassness are the very things they're trying to dull down because that's the thing they think makes them less desirable. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I did not interview a single man for this study. Uh, and so the perspectives on men are through the eyes of women. I really want to be clear about that. And yes, somebody really needs to be talking to men of all sort of educational levels and backgrounds. Actually, there's a lot of sociological work that's been done on men in the lower, you know, in the working classes of the society and sort of their struggles. But Somebody needs to be talking to men, you know, who are educated, but don't seem to want to be uh, with the women who are in some senses their equals. And, you know, I mean, yes, women who are educated and earn money and, you know, have accomplishments, those should be seen as assets to men in our society. But men seem, many men at least, seem to be very intimidated by women who they feel might have outshone them or something. And so women really talked about that and struggled with that a lot. And then there was just this notion that a lot of men just don't want this anymore. They Mm. don't want to be a father. They don't want to settle down. And I heard from the California women in my study, I interviewed a lot of women in the Bay Area and in Silicon Valley Um, who, you know, they had a lot of funny things to say about the kinds of men they encounter, but they really brought up the Peter Pan syndrome. That there are men who may be educated and may make a lot of money, actually, and they will take you out and wine and dine you and be super, you know, flirty and romantic, but they have no intention of settling down with you. Mm. They often play the field, you know, they have all their toys and things that they want to go off and do. And if you hang in there with the Peter Pan you are not going to change him. You're going to be so frustrated. Yeah. And so there, the opening story of a woman I call Kayla talks about that. She hung in there for a year and a half. She froze her eggs with this man. And when it became very clear to her that he had no intention of using those eggs with her, she broke up you yes, know, with yeah. him and then entered into another frustrating relationship. So it, it's, you know, frustrating for women to be in these kinds of relationships with men who just don't seem ready for it. And, and women saying, look, it, it's fair. Some men just don't want to have kids. Some women don't want to have kids. That has to be respected, right? But, Absolutely. Um, you know, you need to find those things out, I guess, pretty early on. Um, you know, if you are a woman who desires reproduction and you end up with a, in, a, uh, in a relationship with a man who's very uncertain that he wants to do that, you could really waste a lot of your fertile years And there's a very poignant story in chapter two, at the beginning of chapter two, of a couple that I call Lily and Jack. Mm -hmm, That chapter is called Romance. And it's a story about a couple in New York City, and she hung in there for a decade with him. She loved him. She she still, at, at the end of the day, considered that man to have been her soulmate. But he was the unreadiest man in the world. Mm. He never got together. When she went off contraception, he refused to sleep with her for 18 months. And she finally just said, um, you know, this is this is not going to work out. So, you know, th- there was just, you know, what I don't know, we need to talk to men about what is creating their feelings of, ooh, I can't do this. And women said, you know, it's so different from our father's generation. Yes. So many w- yes. So many women in the study loved and admired their fathers. And they often said, if I could find a man anywhere near what my dad was like, I'd be so happy. But they had supportive fathers who had supported them and their aspirations. But they were men who wanted to be married and have kids. And then, you know, 30 years on, you have this new generation of men that they were encountering who were not like their fathers at all. You know, and finding a man like that was considered pretty hard. So, the book is about, I mean, it, in some sense, it's kind of grim because it's about women's frustrations with men. Yeah, yeah. And, then, you know, the underlying, if I could just go on to say, well, why is this happening to so many women across the country? And this is where a book that was extremely important to me, a book by John Berger, an economic journalist. Yes, actually, book- John is going to come on later today. We're going to speak with him. Oh. You have to listen to John, too, whoever is listening to the podcast. Yeah, his book, Datanomics, really talked. He used U.S. census data to talk about the growing educational disparities between men and women in this country, which right now there are 27 percent more American women in higher education than there are men. And the numbers, men are just slipping out of higher education. It was really bad during COVID. 71% of the decline in admissions was men. Men just not going to college. So you're you're having a huge population in the millions of women who are educated in their prime reproductive years, 22 to 39, who are in surplus 
there are not enough educated men to meet their sort of reproductive needs. And John called this the man deficit. Yeah. So I talk a lot about that as the underlying demography of this problem. And we're not talking about that in this country, that so many more women are educated than men now um, in these generations. And it is a phenomenon that is occurring all over the world. I actually use the World Bank Gender Parity Index to see where this is happening. It's happening in more than 60% of the world's countries, including wow. all over Western Europe, Canada, the UK, all over Scandinavia, places that we consider like Scandinavia, gender egalitarian place. Their disparities and their mating gap is maybe even bigger wow. than the U.S. and countries. So this isn't just an American issue. This is a global issue. And that's why egg freezing is just booming around the world. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're going to we're very grateful also to have John come on later. And we're going to talk about datanomics and we're going to talk about his book, Make Your Move. And, you know, what he shared was that on his book tour, women were like, OK, great. I hear the data. But now what? And um you know, the, the concept of mixed collar dating, of being open to other types of, of partners and, and maybe, you know, equality doesn't have to look like educational equality, right? What does equality mean for you and your, your, you know, your relationship and getting clear on what you need out of a relationship and maybe being open to a picture that looks a little different, but it certainly is frustrating for women. And on season one, we talked about Richard Reeves book, a book, uh, a boys of men and just the state of men now. And I think, I don't know. I, you know, these, the traditional gender roles were evolving past those and men, you know, what he says or what he finds through his research is men are feeling purposeless when they're, you know, not the provider. They're not in that traditional role. And I wonder if that contributes to men not wanting to get married or have children. But yeah, I, I share the same sentiment. We want some men on here. I would love to hear from them and, and get their lens and their perspective. Cause like you said, it's right now, you know, it's all through the lens of, of women, but I think there is this, this great need and desire for women to understand like what's happening on the other side here, what's going on with these men. Yeah. You know, I, I have to say one of the things I shared in the prologue to my book about my own situation is that the person I ended up marrying didn't have nearly as much education as I did. He had actually dropped out of college when I met him, he was going back to get, you know, finish college, as it were. And he he was movable. He, you know, I knew he was very intelligent and kind. And, you know, I was very attracted to him. <laughs> and, you know, he was willing to, we were both divorced. And so we got together. And he kind of accompanied me on my journal, journey. I'm an anthropologist. I've worked mostly in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so he traveled with me. Then we had children and they came with us. We've had a great adventure in life. And he eventually did get his master's degree, but it was not on my timeline, you know, so it was much later. I had finished a PhD and a master's degree. Wow. A master's degree. You're, so a, ba you're did, a badass, John, Marcia. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I did what John called the mixed collar match. Yeah. I mean, he grown up in the same sort of, I'm going to say class circles as I had, but educationally, he, it was a huge, you know, mismatch, if you will. And I didn't consider it settling. I just thought, oh, he's he's going back to school. He'll just do it on his own timeline. And so women, I think, kind of need to open up their horizons that there yeah. could be men out there who maybe haven't finished college, but are great, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, have, I have some examples of that in the book. Some women who did partner with men um, you know, there was one example of a man who'd been in the U.S. military, a divorced man, and then another example of a, a highly educated Ivy League educated lawyer who married a Western firefighter. Um, or she, she wasn't actually technically married, I think, but they partnered and had children. And so these were not men that they ever thought that they were going to sort of meet and partner with. But they did. And they were they were excellent partners. Yeah. So basically, women are going to need to sort of think about what I did. And then the other option I do want to bring up is there were many women who had frozen their eggs and just thought about what is now being called single motherhood by choice. Mm -hmm. Although the language is a bit, you know, I'm going to say ambiguous, because a lot of women said this is really not by yes, choice. This is exactly. by circumstance. Yes. Me. But, you know, egg freezing does give you a little time to think about whether you want to use those eggs with donor sperm and be a mother, you know, of a child, but without a partner. 
And I would say that many, I talked to many women um, in this study who were contemplating that very thing, saying, look, at it was it's not my first choice, it's a plan B, but I'm at the point of thinking about it. And there were women who had decided to go forward yeah. with that and yeah. had beautiful children. So egg freezing also opens up that possibility. And I, I really think, you know, egg freezing, at the end of the day, I'm not out there promoting egg freezing, you know, I mean, I think it's a painful decision that women have to make. Yeah, it's extremely expensive. It's mostly not covered by insurance. It's exclusionary for the many women who can't afford it. You know, it's not the perfect solution. And it doesn't work all the time. But it is a technology, you know, I called it a technology of hope, despair and repair. Yes, it serves different functions for different kinds of women. And it is, uh, it is an option. It does give reproductive choice to women. And there were some feminist women. I should say women in my study were of different ethnic backgrounds. It yes, was a yeah. mixed population, not just white women, okay? And there were women from different communities saying, this is a, giving us increased opportunities with our reproduction that we didn't have before. It is a reproductive justice kind of issue because it is, uh, you know, helps us to have the families that we want to have. And so, you know, for some women, I think it's a really important technology. At the end of the book, I sort of said, I don't think women in their 20s should be running to egg freezing. Most women in their 20s have good fertility. Many of them will find a partner. And so it's not really something. It's expensive. It's, you know, it's invasive. It is a difficult technology to go through. Women shouldn't just be running off to the IVF clinic. But I do think that women in their early 30s should start thinking about it if they find themselves in the situation of being in the mating gap. Yes, yes. An equal, eligible, educated man, you know, they can't find a partner. Then you need to start thinking about it because fertility is, it does begin to decline slightly at about age 32. And then there is this big plummet that is called the fertility cliff that happens around age 37. Yep. And sometimes it happens earlier for women. Yep. So you've got sort of like sweet spot, this opportunity to try egg freezing. If you really know that you want to have biogenetically related offspring, that you want to be pregnant with your own eggs, but you haven't found the partner and you're worried about that, you know, egg freezing does give a new option to women, you know, in this country and beyond. So at the end of the book, I talk about that. It is a technological tool like other yeah. reproductive technologies, right? I don't think it's, you know, going to be this big revolution like the pill because it is way more expensive, so expensive than the yeah. pill. But I do think more and more women are going to be turning to it. And we know that they are. During COVID, yes. there was a huge yes. upsurge in demand for egg freezing, and it is now being offered around the world. And, you know, more than 80 societies are offering egg freezing regularly. It's being offered in many different countries because women are in the situation around the world. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's so nice that there is this technology and that there is this option. But I like what you said, too, about sort of some of the language around like choice or elective, because I think and this was the sentiment my that I hear from other women and came across in your book that you know, if it were up to me, this is not, this was not the vision, this was not the path and sort of being surprised or a narrative of why me to end up in a situation where you have to start thinking about or considering egg freezing. Um, But with that being said, I agree with you, It, it is, it is hopeful to have a way to preserve optionality and to give yourself some more time if you need it to find that right partner. But Certainly. Yeah, I, I think it's it's amazing to have your book and it's amazing to have these stories out there. And while, like you said, you know, 20 something year olds don't necessarily need to be running that, you know, maybe learning from these old, us older women that like, you, you know, start thinking about it, start thinking about it sooner. And I know a lot of women, myself included, wish we had done it sooner while there was like so much relief in doing it and having that quote unquote, insurance policy in a little bit more time, there was also this feeling of I wish I had done it sooner. So I appreciate you and this book. It's it's so incredible to have this out there. Well, if I could say one thing about it, I I just really would like to say women should not be blaming themselves for the situation they 
themselves and they are not alone. There's so many women in this situation and it's not something women can individually control. So just women stop beating yourself up about not having a partner. You know, it's not your fault. And I think the book really will show women how many other women there are out there, you know, facing similar circumstances in life and how egg freezing, you know, can be helpful um, to women who find themselves, you know, in their 30s, in in their 30s without a partner. This is a tool that, yes, yeah, should definitely be considered for those who have the means to do yeah. so. And I loved, and I know we mentioned this earlier, and I do want to end on this note because I think it's so important that, you know, when you use the word brave in the book, and that resonated with me so much because while I've attached so many words to this process and so many emotions, I don't know why brave wasn't one that I had attached to it. And maybe because there is so much despair and grief and sadness, but it certainly is so freaking brave. And I think that any woman that does it is is a badass and who navigates this is, is incredible. And I love what you said too. It's it's let's stop blaming ourselves for being in this position. Let's be compassionate and kind to ourselves and to each other. Um, so Marsha, I, I cannot say enough how grateful I am for you to be here, to have this conversation, but most importantly for writing this book and doing this research and giving voice to all these women and their stories. I appreciate that so much. And I know I'm telling everybody to read this book. It's just incredible. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth. And I really, I have to say, I've been a pleasure to talk with you today. And I thank all the women who participated in my project and, and allowed their stories to be heard. And so I'm very, very grateful to them too. So thank you so much for having me on um, a wonderful conversation with you today. Thank you. You too, Marsha. And just quickly before we wrap up, where can women find you, find your book? More, I know you've written other articles, so where can they find some more resources from you? Yeah, I mean, the book is on Amazon, and it's also available from New York University Press, NYU Press. Um, the book is available as an, an actual physical book, a Kindle version, and now an audio book. So there are three different versions of it. And I have a personal email, www.marshainhorn.com, um, and I am at Yale. I can be found through the Yale uh, uh, website, too. So many different ways. If anybody wants to contact me, I'm happy to, to respond. And you do very quickly, and you're very gracious and very kind. If you, re- if you email her, she will email you right back. <laughs> so it's so nice. <laughs> Thank you, Marsha, again. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Quiet the Clock. If these stories are resonating with you, please subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for future episodes.